David Shapiro with the Shapiro Group, my colleague Lee Abraham, and here we're here to talk to you about triple net leases, some long-term blue chip investments. Today we're going to talk about the benefits, some of the expenses, the risks associated with it, what are some of the lease terms you can right. expect, the key variables, and then how do you measure ROI? So David, one of the real benefits of the triple net lease is that it's a hands-off investment, it's hassle-free, headache-free, um, also low risk. And the rate of return is a long-term proposition. So when we think about a triple net lease, we'll define that, we'll get into the details there in the slides. The idea is that in a portfolio, this is a solid foundation. This is not a get-rich-quick scheme. Typically, the triple net lease are for individuals, organizations, and entities that have resources that are looking to diversify their uh, risk and return portfolio. And that's the perspective that we bring into this particular analysis here. And so the tenant pays the expenses. And the main ones there being the maintenance of the property, which if you were a multifamily landlord, which is a gross lease, those can be quite expensive, which include the repairs, the insurance, and then the property taxes, which in Texas we know can also be a pretty hefty percentage of the expenses of a property. And so the nice thing for a landlord in this case is that whatever their rental amount is, that's their net. They don't have to think through all the other, right. okay, what are these other things that are going to come up like multifamily or other types of uh, real estate have? Single family, for example, is also a gross lease. So maybe you're most familiar with that type of a rental. So when we talk about risk, um, these triple net leases are the least risky real estate investments that you can make. Um, part of it is the length of the term of the lease, but the other is the corporate guaranteed tenants. Uh, entities like Starbucks, Dollar General, um, these are guaranteed to be paid by a publicly traded company. So it's about as secure a real estate return as you're going to get. We saw this recently with a client where the tenant decided that they no longer wanted to operate the location where our client, they own the building. But this was luckily a large company nationwide that had a lot of resources. And so the company said, well, we signed the lease, we guaranteed it. We're not going to use the property, but we're just going to keep paying the rent. And so that is the benefit of these highly rated large companies when you're doing a triple net lease. So you really want high credit tenants um, and with these long-term leases and you're just locking it, set it and forget it. That's the idea here. And the key comes into play with some of the things we're going to get into with lease terms. But before we do that, let's really discuss risk. So these are the least risky um, real estate investments, but that doesn't mean that they're risk free. So there are a couple of areas where uh, risk presents itself and it starts with the lease renewal. So typically these are going to be 10, 15 year leases. Oftentimes, as we'll see here in a moment, they'll have options for five year incremental increased uh, term on the lease as well, stretch it out to 25, 30 years. However, when that lease ends, ultimately, what happens to the asset? And so is it a matter of replacing the tenant with a similar use and just adding another lease to it? Or one of your favorite opportunities, David, which is redeveloping the property. Mm -hmm. One of your main thesis as I've gotten to know your philosophy on real estate, which is invest in premium real estate. There's more demand. That central Austin core always has more demand, always better in a volatile market in terms of risk aversion. These properties, these blue chip long-term triple net leases are typically on the busiest corner on the most popular street uh, in the particular town or city. And so redevelopment opportunities, I believe, is going to be a big benefit on some of these type of properties when they come to the end of the lease term. As a developer, one thing I'm thinking about is consumer behavior and how it could change over time. We saw a huge disruption with office during the pandemic, right. and that's still, we're figuring out the effects of that and what's going to happen down the road. You know, as I look forward into the future, I see things like autonomous driving. There's a lot of parking lots in downtown Austin. Some of the new high rises going up will have a dozen or 15 stories of parking. 
Well, when you think down the road about autonomous driving, how is that going to impact it? Well, cars don't need to park anymore, or not for that long, just for a little bit to charge. You might go from the average, I mean, it's something in like the one to three hours a car is used every day on average. So it might go to 10 or 14 hours, and now you need less parking. And so what happens to all that parking? Well, could you convert it? So these are the types of things that I'm thinking about as consumer behavior and technology and as we evolve as a society. And so when I'm looking at these properties, I'm thinking, all right, well, is there some sort of future uh, development plan where we, we're going to see the path of growth come towards this property? Could it be something else down the road? What's the current zoning? What's the neighboring zone? There's so many factors in play here. And when we're talking to a client and they're like, look, I want a triple net lease. And we say, okay, well, we can go for this one. We think it has, you know, the X development potential, which is pretty low. Well, this one over here. Return is comparable, but it's got wide development right. potential, which is significantly higher. Right. And so we think this is a better long-term play because it gives you more options. And you've heard me talk about strategies. Whenever I go into buying a property, I want to have multiple strategies. I don't want to be like, okay, I got to be able to short-term rental it. And if that doesn't work, I'm screwed. That's a bad strategy to go into buying a property. I want to be able to have maybe three or more potentially strategies. So on a triple net lease, you have the, great, I got this great triple net tenant in there. Maybe I can add some redevelopment possibility. Maybe it's reposition it, right? It's currently, um, in this photo, we have a Walgreens. So it's right. currently a Walgreens. It's, we don't have to fully redevelop it, but we could reposition it, right. and now it becomes a concert venue. Right. And that's another strategy because we're looking here at what are the rents on a Walgreens versus the rent on a concert venue with the where the path of growth is. Right. And so there's a lot of things that we're looking at, and... We're really in touch. I know I read a dozen articles at least every week on development in Austin. Yeah. I want to know where everything's happening, what's going on. I know you do the same, probably even more than me. Um, and so we're very in touch with what's happening. And so we see a property pop up. We're like, ooh, that's a unique location. That's exciting for whatever reason. Yeah, the other thing when we're just talking about risk um, on these triple net investments is you don't want to get locked into a lease rate that lags the market. In other words, rents keep going up for these type of spaces, but you're locked into a long-term lease at um, a below market rate. That's a risk that you might be taking. So the key there, the devil is in the details with the lease terms, and we'll look at those in our next slide. So when we're looking at the lease terms, obviously it starts with the number of years. That's key. Uh, typically the longer, the better, assuming the underlying terms make sense. Scheduled rent increases. So we do see some corporate entities that don't have increases, believe it or not, um, and they do trade. Um, however, from an ROI standpoint, annual increases, five-year escalations, those type of things will often offset that risk. And we're going to look at a specific property here in a moment or two on some actual terms that are out there. Um, but then the options to renew is a big deal. Um, how many are there? What are their length and duration? How many years? And then what are the scheduled increases that come into play? So understanding some of these key mechanics in the lease terms is really critical. Yeah, and we really want to be able to sit down and use a consultative approach to understand somebody's goals and then say, okay, well, what are the risks that you could, should be worried about? Based on what you've told us with your goals, is this a risk that's really high up here? Or is this to you more of a, a risk down here that we don't need to weight as heavily you know, things like tenant improvements, who was responsible for them. One of the reasons that you want a long lease on these triple net leases is oftentimes the owner of the property has to put money in yeah. up front and they need to recoup that money over a long period of time. So we're taking into account these different variables. How strong is the tenant? Because that, that's going to be really important if you're signing a long lease with a lot of upfront tenant improvements. But the key variables here, we talked about tenant strength, are they high credit tenant Location of the property, obviously that's really important, especially as we talk about we're trying to release it down the road if, it, if they don't renew or redevelop it. Or redevelop it. Cap rate, which is the return for you as the investor. And we'll be getting into this in quite a bit of detail here in just a moment regarding cap rates. And then one of the other key variables that really can't be overlooked in this type of scenario is the building details. David mentioned it earlier about repositioning a property. You know, you have something like um, a Dollar General, something, basically a box. Um, then you have like a Walgreens, which is kind of a box with a pharmacy in the back. Then you've got something like a coffee distribution venue that is 
uniquely improved for that specialty. And so these are some of the things that you have to look at when you're evaluating which corporate partner do you want to work with over and above the obvious things like what's the lease rate, what's the location, and things like that. And your point with this is that that's going to determine how easy it is to release it at the end of the lease. And ultimately how it reflects on your risk. So this is one of our favorite things, ladies and gentlemen, ROI. We like to calculate it. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about cap rate. We're going to give a nod to tax shelter and uh, we'll wave at equity growth as we race through this analysis. <laughs> so uh, there's quite a bit in terms of ROI um, and we'll let uh, this next couple of slides do the heavy lifting. Why don't you walk us through this off for David? So this is for a caliber collision. And you can see that the beautiful thing here for the owner is it's, it's a brand new building. Right. So now the other cool thing for is a triple net is that the tenant's responsible. The advantage to the owner of a new construction building is that if this tenant at the end of their lease term doesn't renew, the building is not already 20 years old when they're first buying it. It's now only 10 years old or however long the lease term is initially. It's in one of the fastest growing markets. And, you know, people during a recession, guess what? They fix up their car more. Yeah. It's one of those things that's recession resistant, pandemic resistant. That's not to be understated. As I mentioned earlier, these investments are typically used to give a foundation to a portfolio to provide some liquidity, some cash flow in a seasoned resource pool. It's not the first investment somebody's going to make. As a result of that, these businesses that would be occupying your real estate, you have some choices. You're going to see places like Caliber Collision that are proven to be um, you know, pandemic proof. You've got, you know, these health care, quick care, um, urgent care, care type uses. You've got fast food. There's an array of sectors, the type of market vertical that you want to be in for your long term perspective. One other thing, David, is that these investments are not only located in our beautiful hometown of Austin, Texas, but they're all over the country. And we can really do a nice job of diversifying risk geographically as well. So that's another way for these particular investment vehicles to be a risk strategy management solution for people. Yeah. And the great thing about the mean triple net is they're really easy to manage from afar. Yeah. Because you're not responsible for the maintenance. Correct. And you've got these big tenants, you know, like a caliber collision or a Walgreens. Like they have all asset management teams that are handling a lot of this stuff. And so it makes it a very simple process for yeah, a landlord. It's very clean. So here we have some of the details. This is a um, property that's priced, as you can see, at about $4 million, just over $4 million. And generally, David, these assets are going to be ranging from you know, $1.8, 2 million up to $4, $4.5 million. They can be combined. You can see shopping centers that are just chock full of these triple net leases. 25, 35, 50 million dollar assets in terms of shopping center. One of the nice things is that these are snackable investments, um, standalone real estate that offers a lot of benefits to an investor. Mm -hmm. So this particular property you might show, uh, use the cursor so people can follow a little bit, but it's what? Just over 11,000 square feet. It's on a little over an acre, built in 2023. It's a 15 year lease at a 5.75 cap rate. And so if somebody buys this cash, they're getting a 5.75% return on their investment. And we're gonna break that down in excruciating detail in just a moment. Um, and you can see that 6.34. So basically what they're showing there is that the 5.75 cap rate in that bottom left-hand corner, because of the increases in the lease rate, the cap rate goes up over time. So here's some of our analysis on it. And so the first thing we're going to look at is if you do this with 50% cash and 50% loan. Just some basic leverage. 6% loan and a 4% annual price appreciation in the value of the property. Because the cap rate does not take into account appreciation, which is 
potentially a big component of your return when you look at the whole picture here. So here we've charted over the next 25 years showing your, your IRR, your internal rate of return, which is a really great all-encompassing way to look at return, your TRR, AGR, cap rate. So there's a lot of numbers, okay? Yeah. And if you're not a numbers person, right. you're not used to looking at these things, that's okay. We are. Yes. We live and breathe this stuff. Yes. We can talk your ear off about this stuff um, if you'd like, if, if you're into the numbers. And if you're not, we'll just simplify it for you. Yeah. And we can just say, look, you want something, you know, pretty simple. Here's this one versus this one. This is the higher one. Here's why we like it more, et cetera. We can, we can distill this down for you very simply. So you don't have to be a numbers person. Um, so don't worry if this is too much. Yeah, if it's too much, don't worry about it. But basically, we're just looking at how much cash are you getting every month? How much tax shelter are you enjoying every year? And then at the end of the holding period, how much have you made on your initial investment in terms of equity? It's as simple as that, or it can be really complicated. We can go as deep as you'd like. The bottom line is, David, that we've done our due diligence. We know what we're offering with these type of investments. And if you are looking at diversifying your resources, you're representing, whether it's a family office, um, you're putting together a group of investors with your friends or colleagues. This really is the type of thing over time that will not only build wealth, but will create other opportunities to invest and work together with folks like us that can really help guide you through the process. Yeah. While you're giving examples other than family offices, institutions, yeah. um, we see a lot of business owners. They have an exit. They made a lot of their money maybe yes. on the internet. And they're yes. like, you know what? The internet's great. I want something physical in the real world, an asset that I can rely on that's always going to pay me because this whole internet thing I just did, that was great. It worked out for me. The asymmetric returns where potentially they can put a lot of time and energy into something and nothing happens, but potentially it, and that, and they were one of the fortunate ones They or they're, they're in addition to being smart and savvy and, and uh, hardworking and they had a great exit and they're like, okay, let me take a bucket of this money. Let me put it over here right. in this thing that for generations has proven to continue to appreciate and just can consistently create wealth, which is real estate. And I can have a check coming to me every month right. and I don't have to worry. It covers my lifestyle. And now, boom, I can take more risks in the tech world right. and do these other cool things that I want to do, start a founding, whatever, because I have this baseline of income right. and assets that I know is very secure. Absolutely. Well said. And then scenario two, we got the all cash. And so this is a little bit simpler because the cap rate is what the return is. Yeah. Um, and you know, this for some people is just, again, if you had a big lump sum, you just want to put it in cash. You're not worried about the leverage. The cash flow is more important to you. We would tell you buy two. <laughs> leverage and buy two? Yeah. Well, unless you know somebody's 70 years old and they just want cash flow. And that's really important to them. And the tire return is not the most important thing. I mean, if you just look here, your cash on cash after taxes at any point after tax shelter, is that the idea? Yeah. Your cash on cash after tax shelter at any point here is higher when you have leverage. Yes. But maybe that's not the most important thing to you. Maybe it's your cash on cash, which is actually slightly higher. Right. You look over on this chart versus this slightly higher if you don't have leverage. Right. Bottom line is there's options, there's ways to do it. You don't necessarily need $4 million cash to invest in this property is another takeaway. So we just felt that it was important to um, discuss this product line. It really is um, a viable solution for a lot of folks out there. And um, we'd like to be your solution in helping you, um, you know, create wealth with real estate. And we think the triple net lease is one way to get there. What would you say is the minimum entry point? So if somebody's doing 50% down, you said like one and a half million were starting points. So they need about 750 grand between them and whoever else is investing. With yeah, them. I think if you're in that ballpark of resources, let's at least have a conversation. Um, there's all different shades of gray with these type of investments. And we're showing you the best of the best today. So um, if you're interested, give us a call, let us know, and um, we'll discuss it. Yeah, you can just go down to the description, schedule a call directly with Lee or I. We'd love to hop on, hear more about your goals, and see if it's a good fit for us to work together. We would love to be your real estate solution.